Hey guys, how are you today? Today on Slice of Advice, we have Becca Cortese, um, otherwise known as the Happy Ever Crafter. <sighs> to be honest with you, <coughs> this one might be one of my favorites, one of my most exciting ones. Um, Becca, I've known for a really freaking long time, both like back and forth, as well as uh, like we've met in person now because of the wonderful Letter West. Um, but she's always been someone that I have had the biggest admiration for because she seems to just be able to do it all, which is amazing. So before I jump in, I want to remind you guys that I've got my pricing calculator still available, uh, well, currently available, and I actually. Like, I know I said I did some tweaks a couple of weeks ago, but now I've done some more tweaks. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I'm really, really excited for you guys to experience it, to see it. I actually had someone the other day being like, oh, I ran the numbers using the pricing calculator and have worked out that I could be charging more. Um, I'm too scared to charge like lots more, but I've just increased it by $10 and now I just made $400 more on a new job. So that was really exciting. <laughs> anyway. Let's get into it. I'm gonna accept her onto the line. Excited about. <laughs> it's okay, we're all good. I'm just like keeping my cool, keeping my calm. Just, yeah! Hi, <laughs> oh, sorry. My goodness, look at all of the twinkling lights. This is so pretty. I had uh, to light my room up somehow because it's nighttime here. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, time zones are our friends uh <laughs> as we've definitely uh, found out as of recently um i'm actually going to go straight into the news that i and you have been like spruiking constantly um and i actually i actually messaged peggy and i was going to message you this afternoon being like thank you so much for involving me i'm really really excited <laughs> involving you in what Oh, well, uh, involving me in the holiday party that is happening next week on what is my Friday, but your Thursday. Um, I am so excited. <laughs> like, I've been going, okay, what am I going to wear? What am I going to do? And now, um, slight spoiler alert, uh, apparently there's teams. But uh, so for those who haven't either seen my story or seen Becca's story, um, we're having a holiday party and not only am I invited, which uh, as a solo freelancer, being invited to Christmas parties is a, a bit of a big deal. Uh, <laughs> but I and you guys all have been invited to this awesome Christmas party. Please tell us a little bit more about it, Becca, because I know I'm not going to do it justice. <laughs> well, honestly, last year, you just nailed it when you said that you like as a freelancer, it's exciting to get invited to a holiday party. Cause last year, Peggy and I had the idea because there's so many of us artists on here who are like friends and like coworkers almost. Uh, but we never actually get to hang out in real life or like no nobody gets a holiday party because we're just in our offices working by ourselves. So last year, that's kind of how it started, but also cause COVID sucked and we all needed a party and, and whatever. Um, so we threw a holiday party for letterers and calligraphers and just like pulled together some fun artists to do a trivia game with. Uh, and it was all for charity. And we raised over $11,000 last year just by having a trivia party and like people joining in and having fun. Uh, and so obviously we have to do it again this year. I mean, clearly. And it was like the highlight of 2020 last year. It was so fun. Uh, so it's just a bunch of artists playing. And last year it was trivia. This year it's like a mix of trivia and like a game show kind of thing. Uh, I'm not going to tell you too much because you're not allowed to know. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and we all just kind of get on. Like we, the art, the people participating in like the the participants, the what do we want to call them? Like the the contestants because it's a game Ooh. show. Uh, they all are going to be in a zoom and then we're going to live stream it to YouTube so everybody can watch and everybody can play along at home. Um, and it's all for charity. There's an auction uh, full of stuff. Oh, like a the million auction amazing looks prizes. insane. Like the prizes I'm sitting there going like, wow, I yeah. want to win them, but I'm in it, but I want it, but uh, 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 sorry. Uh, and I also kind of put up some stories um, saying about people registering um, and I'll make sure that in the 
the description of this as well as the replay. I'll put the, the link in. But if you guys register, one of you can actually come and play with us, which is kind of freaking cool. Yeah, we're doing a draw for one audience member to play in the game and actually play for their own charity too. So, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Um, I believe my charity this year is Headspace, which I feel like is a, a really kind of close to the heart um charity that I'm, I'm being part of or have chosen as my charity. Um, we have all needed a little bit of extra mental health uh, assistance these last couple of years. Um, and yeah, it was really, really important for me to choose that. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that the fact that it's actually uh, charity based and it's going to have this amazing impact. It's just, it's awesome. So thank you for inviting yeah, we, me. We thank you for inviting me. The happyevercrafter.com slash holiday party. But that's not what we're here to talk about. It's not, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of, but it isn't, but it is, but it isn't. So I wanted to get you on here for the longest time because let's address the elephant in the room. And it's something that I've actually like addressed with some of my students is there is a lot of different pricing courses and courses that are going to help you with, you know, the way that you price your work and then, but you and I both do pricing courses and I feel like it's a, a really important thing to kind of acknowledge that we're not competition, we're community. We, we both help each other and we both like share a lot of the same thoughts around pricing, um, especially when it comes to empowering our students to be charging their worth and, and actually you know, running their numbers and doing all of the things that they should be doing to be able to recognize that, hey, you're worth more than you're probably charging. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you've been running panic-free pricing for quite a few years now. And I'm pretty sure that I, I like every time that it comes out again, I'm just like, Oh yeah, I want this. I love this. I love this. This is so good. Um, yeah. We, we wrote it in 2017, which feels crazy. Um, and then since then we've just kept updating it and making it bigger and bigger and bigger um, because we kept keep getting more and more questions about pricing, but the work is never done with pricing. <laughs> As you know, oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely never done. I feel like I every week learn something more about the way that people prefer to price, the way that people prefer to pay as well. It comes into it a lot of the time. And, and it's also something that like lights me up, gets me fired up, gets me like really excited when people are like, oh, I don't know how to do this. I'm like, how can I help? And I'm, I know that you're very similar with that. So yeah, we actually just the other night had a, a coaching, like a small group coaching call with panic repricing students. And like, it's, I, I, it exhausts me because it's, it's price, pricing is exhausting for everyone. It's a big topic and it's, it's not an easy thing to like talk about, but the more I talk about it, the more fired up I get about it every time. Yeah, for sure. And I, um, I'm in the panic free prices Facebook group as well. And I, I've, I really appreciate one, how uh, active you are in there, but also how active and community based it becomes of like, I've looked at this or I've done this and I'm thinking that this is maybe too much or this is too cheap. What do you think? And everyone just jumps in and everyone, it's a really community based thing. And that's, that's why I truly believe that like pricing is a shared experience, but a personal like thing to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely becomes like, how can we each help kind of uplift each other when it comes to pricing? For sure. So when you're pricing your work, because you've obviously got um, the, the uh, panic free pricing course, you've got your other courses, you've got your show me your drills, which that is a whole other beast in its own. It's just massive. Um, if I can stop complimenting you constantly I probably wouldn't be able to anyway um but you've got all of these other bits and pieces that you do plus you do like the client work like the walls and the and the um the windows that you've been doing lately so how do you prefer to price your creative work when it comes to those kind of client pieces oh my god uh it's such a mix of things like Mm -hmm. it it really depends on the project and on what it is, because I mean, as you know, as everybody watching knows, you can do so many different things with your lettering skills um, or your, whatever skills it is that you're doing as an artist. Um, but for me, it always comes back to like calculating how long it's going to take me, multiplying that by my hourly rate, figuring out how much supplies are going to cost. Obviously those are the basics, but most of the time that's where people stop. 
Mm -hmm. Like, especially beginners, they're like, oh, that's going to take me two hours times my hourly rate, plus the cost of the pens, and then they just call it a day. And then you're like, no, but also, like, that's great. That's the minimum you should be making. Uh, but then you need to adjust. You're like, yeah, I know, I know, you know, I'm, you know, where I'm going. Um, but then, yeah, you have to tweak it around like value based things. Is this, are you doing this for a huge business that it's going to bring them a bunch of more business? Then you need to adjust for that you know, all sorts of things. And so for me, it's like, starting with the basics coming up with like the very minimum that I should be making from this project, and then tweaking it based on a bunch of other small factors. That's usually so how do I you do generally it. keep that like time it's going to take you an hourly rate to yourself and give the client the whole numbers? Yeah, yeah, they get the total. They don't get any yeah. of how I got to that. Yeah. Yeah, because I've found that um, this is going uh, back a bit. But when in the past, I've gone, okay, uh, it's going to take me 10 hours. They, they watch the clock and they sit there and they want to get like everything out of that exact time and hours. And I feel like, uh, I think um, when we did our uh, YouTube on how do you price murals, Terrence like brought up just the most wonderful, clear answer of like, I don't like to be charging hourly because I don't like when um, I feel rushed. And yeah. it was just like, like that just makes yeah, that or like you don't you don't want to feel like you can't take a lunch break or you don't want to feel, you know, like your client is watching your every move, trying to make sure they get the best out of you for like the shortest amount of hours. It just doesn't make any sense. Plus, if you and I, I saw you did a post about hourly rates sucking today. And that's why, like, I think <laughs> you're like, yeah, this is top of mind for you. But like, oh, I wrote a ranty charge... blog like it was just like. <laughs> You know, like the cat that's just like, like that was me just being like, they suck and this is why, but also like this, but also like this. Yeah. But like, why would you want to, why would you want to charge hourly, especially if you're experienced? Because then you're shooting yourself in the foot when you work quickly. Like, mm -hmm. it's just, And then it, a, yeah, a, a client when, that is, you know, working in a business has probably worked out what their hourly rate is. And, you know, comparison trap happens to us all. And that would definitely happen with a client is the client sitting there going, well, why are they getting paid this much when I'm only getting paid this much? And then like talking about, um, maybe they start comparing themselves and it's like, oh, well, your time's worth more than mine. Well, no, because it's not time-based. Like, you know, if you're going to be really, really quick, and so you can do a job that's going to be um, taking 10 minutes, but it takes all of this constant, like all of this uh, experience and you like then work it out, it's like, oh, it's six fifty an hour. And then the client just faints, like just dies right there. They're gone. Like you're gonna throw them off. And I think it, it kind of throws out that balance and respect of not so much time but skill. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And there's no there's no um like exact math for any of it. It's also like when I say that I adjust for value based, it's just experience and like me understanding in my head how much this should be worth based on mm. my value. Like there, I find that's the hardest part to explain to beginner pricers uh, is like ha exactly how much to adjust for that stuff. Yeah, because it's not a uh, times by 1.6 or anything like that. It's yeah. you, you need to start asking questions. Um, I have some questions that I ask. So for instance, um, like how valuable is this to a client if this wasn't a problem, if the solution that I'm bringing wasn't a problem, like what's the value of that? But then there's more like tangible things. Like for instance, if you did a window um, and it brought in 10% more customers and that converted to like a hundred dollars more sales, that's something that is potentially being able to be factored in. And it's not like you're going to sit there and go, hey, client, you're only worth this much. It's, it's more just a communication and a, a conversation of like, this is how much my solution is valued in, like, in the grand scheme of things. Is yeah, and, and again, oftentimes that's intangible. Like, I can't tell you how much my pretty window is bringing into them in revenue, but I know that it's attracting people to their business. And I know that it has value. And so I'm not going to just charge for exactly the number of hours it takes me and call it a day. Like it, 
it, it you have to adjust for the value. So it's tricky, yeah. but yeah, once you get more uh, experienced, you end up having, you end up knowing, and it sounds like you have figured out exactly what you ask, and I'm sure you teach it in your course, is what questions to ask in your discovery process without having to just say, how much money is this going to bring you? You know, yeah. like you're asking yeah, things sure. strategically. Yeah. And I think um, the other part that a lot of people forget is that, um, you know, what's the kind of revenue or what are they going to make, but also how is it going to change their end customer's perception of them? Like if you make this window and it looks beautiful and it makes someone go, oh, they've created this kind of experience for me to walk into, um, say, for like uh, I, I saw that the other day, the, the bridal windows, uh, that you did, which I'm mm -hmm. very attuned to at the moment because I am bridal dress shopping. It is the worst because, um, <laughs> you know, five months till the wedding because that's the right time to get a dress, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Love that. Yeah, thanks. I'm really enjoying the protest. Uh, <laughs> but, like, it's if it's something that changes the customer's perception and therefore makes them more likely to buy from the client from your client then that's really valuable too um so like the difference between a twenty dollar dress a two thousand dollar dress and a twenty thousand dollar dress like that would actually change what you charge a client yeah for sure which is like again it's hard to put your finger on it but it comes with mm. experience and it comes with learning from people like you and i who are telling people who <laughs> don't just charge your exact hourly rate and some tips and tricks on how to communicate your value. Yeah, I think it's really, it's really, really important. Um, so how do you split your time between client work, the teaching, the generating content, because you generate so much content that we are all just trying to keep up um, and being a freaking amazing woman forced to be reckoned with, you, you're really kind of, I still haven't gotten over this whole complimenting you thing. Um, but you, you're very open with your process and I, I know you recently, um, changed up your plans for your YouTube channel. Like, how do you balance all of that? Oh my God. I mean, as you know, with the, when you own a business, it's different every day. It's not like I have, you know, I'm not one of those. I've, I've always aspired to be one of those people who has like Mondays are for this and Tuesdays are for this and Wednesdays are no, absolutely not. My it's Fridays different. are my personal development day. But no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh flying by the Can seat of my pants. Can you imagine like that? That'd be amazing. That'd be I so know. cool. I know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not like that. Um, most of the time it's like, oh, I got to put out a YouTube video. Like I got to film it and then put it up like ASAP or like, oh, I forgot to, I forgot to talk about the fact that I put a YouTube video out. But no, my, my answer to your question is most of it, like I would see these days 70, maybe 70% 70 is like content creation. And then 10% is client work. Like it's not a lot of client work uh these days and that's i mean that's my choice i i'm very specific about what i take on and i only do the client work that i want which is a super fortunate thing to say um which and then comes but, from experience and time and effort yeah. and energy that you've built up over okay how long yeah. have you been doing what you do uh six six years six years nice six. yeah yeah um and at first yeah i was just you know, throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what stuck, like doing everything, saying yes to thing. Um, but no, That's now it's a great analogy of like, this is actually going to take me on a complete tangent. But um, when I was little and we used to go out for dinner to an Italian restaurant, you know how they have like that rendered wall that has like the different like levels and layers. And no, no. Some restaurants have like these rendered walls that have like texture on the walls. And my dad had told me that they had had like a spaghetti fight and then just painted over the walls. And for so long, I believed it. I was like, oh yeah, that's what happened. That's what happened. So when you say spaghetti and see what sticks to the walls, I'm like, I want pasta. I definitely want pasta now. Honestly, that's what the, the walls in my house look like when I moved into house. Oh no. They were all textured. Like so kind of much awful. renovations on that place. That was, it's incredible. Yeah. It's, a, it's awesome. So, so you're just, yeah. you're generally kind of just like the seat of your pants, but semblance of organization is what I'm getting from it. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely more organized than I used to be, but, um, 
a lot of it is just like, I'm just, I'm just here behind the scenes working. Like I, I also always have aspired to be a person who has stuff batched and scheduled in advance. And that's definitely not who I am. I'm like very much, but at the same time, I find that really helpful because I, I'm paying attention to what people are asking for in the moment. And I'm not mm -hmm. just making up, I'm not just making things up and assuming, um, so I don't know, it works for me, but I, I... No, it definitely does. It's it's definitely shows. It's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so because we both teach, teach and preach pricing, we're clearly pretty passionate about it. What do you think is the one big thing people forget when it comes to pricing? Um, I, I have to go back to what I said earlier, that I think the biggest thing, and I see it time and time again with the students in my course is that they forget that their time and skills have value and not just, you know, it's not just worth exactly how much time it took you. Um, yeah. we, like we talk a lot about knowing your hourly rate, but it, that's not the whole picture. And people need to understand that when someone is coming to them for a project, it's because that person can't do it themselves, which gives your skills inherent value. Um, and what you're giving to them is often bringing them business as, a, as mm -hmm. an artist too. So um, I think that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing that people forget. Yeah. I, mean, what would I, you say I, for that? I, I tend to agree with that, but I think it's also that um, uh, artists, creatives, letter, letterers, we forget not only that our skill has value, but we actually have a skill that's desired by others. Like it's, actually really easy for us because we've put in the time effort and energy to be able to develop that skill but it's it's not like oh no anyone can draw literally not anyone can draw like you <laughs> um not anyone can write letters like you not not anyone can do what you do that's why they're hiring you they've actually chosen to hire you or to even dream of hiring you and you know sometimes it's you know you're creating an aspirational uh, element to working with you by being skilled it's actually like mm -hmm. not as easy one of the things too that I, I am constantly reminding people is to not assume what the client places value on um, mm -hmm. like it's crazy you, you hear all these artists or you know and they'll, they'll be like oh well I can't I can't charge ten dollars for my ornament because Michael sells them for four or like, I can't charge $10 for my ornament because it only took me 30 seconds to write the name on it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, but like, there's so many buts there. And it, it, what, what a client, if a client is coming to you, they value what you're going to give them. Like they value a handmade product. I also see people all the time being like, I can't charge that much because it would be much cheaper to do it on a Cricut. And it's like, yeah, but the person who's coming to you doesn't want it on a cricket. They want it handmade. There is a market for handmade products and people are all over it. Like there's a reason why they're coming to you. It's not mm -hmm. like it's it's not because they don't know that cricket exists. I mean, I'm sure some people don't know that cricket exists, but it's a different it's a different thing and the value is different for your your handmade stuff. I'm I'm glad you brought that up because it, it's one of those things that um is probably gonna be formed into another ranty blog which is becoming a bit of a theme but it's like what does your client actually value and if it's you know they value something being cheap or attainable that's one person if they value the time that you're saving them if they value the skill level that you have or the convenience of not doing it themselves like I've got people that I hire that I could do the exact same thing as what they're doing but I've got other stuff to do. Like I've got other shit to do. So yeah. like hiring someone because of convenience or because like you literally don't have something that someone, like, you don't have the time to do it. That's a massive like value add. If you can make that, make that your thing. Yeah. And I'll say like, as an example, um, not, not as an example of someone not wanting to spend their time on it, but I had a client approach me a couple of weeks ago um, and they wanted this really big sign for a, a local Christmas market that's happening here. And they, they needed it to be fully permanent for outdoors because it was going to be outside. 
they wanted it on like uh, it was it was very specific what they asked for I I remember so I got on, yeah so I got on the phone with her and I said first of all I can't guarantee that it'll be 100% accurate or 100% permanent um because it's the nature of a handmade product like I'll do what I can I'll seal it the best I can I'll use the right materials and stuff but I can't I can't promise it and I kind of asked her I was like if you're looking for something completely permanent, like what, what is it about? Like, why did you approach me as opposed to, you know, going and getting something pre-made like a, like a vinyl or getting like a, a graphic made. And she was like, we really don't want a pre-made graphic. We don't want a digital graphic. We want something handmade and we'll do whatever it takes to get it as close to permanent as possible, just because we want you to hand make it. Like people value that it's not, yeah. um, they're not coming to you because yeah, because again, they don't know that cricket and vinyl exists. It's because they want your handmade stuff. Um, so I love that. And also just back to the the whole like, what you can't assume what somebody's willing to pay for your price or for it's your- It's actually really rude to kind of assume it too. Right? Then you know what like, they say about assuming. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I asked that a you and me. Yeah. And it's like, it's kind of like, oh, I'm too expensive for you. Okay, first, how do you know? Like, it's the pretty woman situation. It's the, you don't need to shop here. All of the dresses are out of your price range. Like, if you have that situation with a client that you're like, I'm too expensive for you, straight away, probably assuming. But you don't know. You just don't know until you start asking questions. And you ask, you know, what what is the value that you're placing on this? Like, what is the reason why you find this valuable to you? And if you are in doubt, ask that question. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's been a couple of times where like I've found that um, like a client doesn't realize that they've placed the value on something um, that they, they didn't work out what the value was to them. And ask, asking those questions actually helps them work through their process as well. I think a lot of the time we assume that the client actually knows what they want, but they potentially don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like you probably see that a lot more with graphic design stuff. Um, yeah. Like sometimes with, we do with... have to be the, the one who spends the budget for them. <laughs> yeah. But like with, with, you know, hand lettering and calligraphy specifically like signs and things. Um, a, a lot of the time the client has no idea what value to place on it. So you, mm -hmm. you have to be the one to educate them on it too. Yeah. So uh, the words lettering empire do come to mind when it comes, when I think of happy ever crafter. Um, but I would actually debate that you have the superpower of community. So the, the you, your face, your face is like, come on guys. Like just, just, just calm it down. Like just calm it down. But it, the. Cool it jazz. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, so like <laughs> bringing people together on the Facebook group. Uh, being able to have like these events and challenges of show me your drills as well as the holiday party next week. Um, is that something that you set out to do to create these kind of communities around these products or is that something that has just been like a really happy result of? Uh, it's been a really happy result that uh, has sort of led me to like, that's my, that's my jam now, mm -hmm. you know, like, when I think about the things that fire me up the most and the things that get me the most excited and the things that I, I get, like I'm constantly inspired to make more things. They all are related to community building and like building a community of letterers and calligraphers. Workshop week was like my absolute favorite thing I've ever done. It was so much fun. Um, and the holiday party, like I, I, this, the holiday party has nothing to do with my business. I just like love doing community things like that but actually it's funny uh when I started show me your drills in 2016 um of I which I've got a show me your drills post that then you shared and I was just like oh my god it's like a shit <laughs> yeah I remember that um but I the first time I ran it I actually was this close to not making a Facebook group for it because I didn't think that people would want it like I didn't think that I thought it would just be noise on Facebook and there's already so many Facebook groups and I thought yep. I don't think we really need to do that and then little did I know that would turn into a huge community um and it's the best it's the best community I mean 
in my opinion. It's the best, it's the best <laughs> community. <laughs> the people on there are incredible. And it's, yeah, it's like my favorite part of the business is running the communities and just like connecting people to each other. Yeah. There's something so freaking special about seeing people that you've connected or you've been able to um, place in a situation where they can connect. Like it's, it's such an amazing feeling of being like, Oh, I ended up catching up with such and such, or we had a, a um, like an Instagram live together, or we, we had a chat together and seeing those like macro like micro connections happen but then it's all part of this massive infrastructure it's just it's incredible to see those connections yeah I would say probably the the biggest like and it would be even crazier if I did it now but in 2017 no 2018 uh I, I traveled around the world and did meetups everywhere and people were there like even in the smallest <laughs> cities like there were people there that wanted to just bring their pens and sit down and hang out with each other. And then like I left and they all still talk. They're all like a little lettering group because of that. Like it's wild to me. Yeah. It's definitely something that like, if you can bring people together, it's really freaking exciting, like yeah. really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I actually do remember that uh, you going around and then and, and you came to Australia. I'm pretty sure. Because you did Singapore. Did. You did. Yeah, yeah. And I missed out on, I remember being like devastated at missing out on the meetup because I think you were catching up with um, Emma as well, our uh, um, black yeah. chalk coat. Yeah. yeah, Emma and I Words. went, we, uh, we did the whole coat, like a, we, I forget what direction it was or whatever, but we did a whole coast. We did a little road trip and stopped in a bunch of places. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's insane. Imagine now. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, especially since uh, we are currently still having all of the lockdowns and all of the border challenges and stuff like that. So it's actually, I think it rather than makes us really thankful and grateful for the travel that we did have. And my version of that is Letter West. Like I was not expecting to go to Letter West. Um, I was wonderfully and thankfully chosen by um becca classen uh to basically get the scholarship and i was there for an half an hour before and a half an hour after the actual event like i just flew in flew out um and it was one of the most amazing experiences like just other words i remember that i remember you getting off the plane and we were all waiting there already like you landed and got on the bus yeah and same with like got off the bus and ran to the, the terminal uh me and mary kate mcdevitt are just like we're gonna get on our flights we're gonna go we're gonna go um but yeah that that whole experience was incredible as well and i feel like it it really shows you that it doesn't matter the size of the community that you're you're part of it's the the impacts and the friendships that you make like i'm you know you and i both now are really quite good friends um with katie um uh from lumia and that friendship really kind of took off during Letter West. Like that was really cool. And then ours, of course, as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Am I choppy to you right now? Can you hear me properly? Because my but... keeps going. Okay, I'm going to turn my Wi-Fi off. Hold on. I just thought that there was a couple of times where I was saying something and I was Choppy like, for she, me doesn't for right she doesn't agree. That's it. She doesn't agree. She's just like, uh, no, Jazz, you're wrong. Thanks. <laughs> Am I back? Yes, you're back. You're here. You are okay. wonderfully okay. here. <sighs> this is, okay. So when I chat with guests and when I've, I've connected with guests, um, I generally kind of ask the same kind of questions, but I tend to switch it up a little bit depending on obviously the guest, which you would know very well. Um, so a lot of people have said when they've um, been asked the next question of like, they'd, they'd go back and, and tell them to change this, that or the other. Um, but if you could go back to a younger Becca and tell her something about pricing, what would you tell her? <laughs> um, I think... The first one would be don't take that first job uh, for $2 an hour. 
<laughs> is that the, I did the uh, baby imitation, the baby shower? Yes, I did. Yeah, the first client job I ever did was baby shower invites, and it was for a friend of a friend, and I didn't do the math. Uh, actually we didn't agree on a price before I said I would do it. I just started doing it. And then later I went back and did the math and it was, I literally was making $2 an hour for what I checked. Um, and no, but I think that I would tell beginner Becca to, um, never start a job without talking about the price first. Like I think and I, I see so many beginners in my courses struggling with this, which it sounds so duh, but when you're in the moment and you're starting with clients who are often like friends and family or friends of friends, it's really awkward to talk about a price before you get started. And it's because you get so excited when someone approaches you and asks you to do something that you're like, mm-hmm. you know, you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot right away by telling them a price and then they're going to ghost you. But if you don't talk about it up front, it's going to be way more awkward later when you have to bill them and you're going to be tempted to drop your price because you're like, Oh, I can't charge them that much. I should have told them up front and now I can't go back and I can't. So like I would tell myself to never, I, I did that a bunch of times when I first started and I, and I kicked myself every time. Um, mm-hmm. And also I think talking about the price up front, even now, like if I get a, an inquiry that's, um, I have my starting app prices on my website, but if I get an inquiry that sounds a little bit uh, like they're not fully ready, they're not fully in, right? And I just, it's a vibe, uh, but I'll it usually is. start by giving them a bit of a ballpark right up front so that I don't get into asking questions and getting too far into the details. Because mm-hmm. I, I used to just, I used to not want to talk about price up front because I wanted to like convince them and get them really excited and then tell them the price so that they wouldn't bail, which is so dumb because... I got ghosted so many times. Like I had so many people that would get all in. They tell me all their details, whatever. And obviously yeah. in their head, they're thinking it's a hundred dollars. And then when I tell them it's 2000, then they're like, Oh, never mind. And they just don't answer. And then I've wasted all my time. So talk about the price up front. I think that would be my answer. Yeah. I like that. Um, and also anyone who is on the live at the moment, if you have any questions, please do put them in the questions box because we are definitely open for the questions. I did have one person, um, the, the green nib, and I don't know if she's still here, um, asked about the number one pricing tip that you have. Um, and I think that we've like covered so many of the, the tips that we would actually say are like, the number one is like a top 10. Like there's like 10 yeah. different things that I'm like, or you could do this or you could do that or make sure that you do this and make sure that you do that. Um, I think if I, good. like if I could only say one thing to a beginner with pricing, it would probably be either what I just said to my young self or um, full price or free. And I don't know if you agree with the full price or free concept, Jazz, I do. but okay. so I my, really do. Yeah. So my my like quick explanation is that I do full price or free. I don't do discounts. Uh, so and the reason why is because it gets really awkward again, especially when you're starting with friends and family and friends of friends and all of those awkward situations where somebody's approaching you because you're a small business. They assume that because because they sort of know you that you're going to, they're going to, you're going to give them a better price, which is just like the worst, like the people closest to you should be supporting you the, the most and wanting the to like pay you double. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what I do now and I've been doing for a long time and I learned this originally a long time ago from Sean McCabe, Sean West. Um, mm-hmm. He brought this up and then I, and I just have continued doing it ever since. And it's changed my pricing life is if it's, like I have the circle of people who I would be happy to do projects for, for free. It's like my mom, my dad, my brothers, my, you know, best friend. And I'm happy to do stuff. If they need something, if one of them's getting married, I'm going to do all their stuff for free. Of course I will. Mm -hmm. Um, and then anyone else is full price. There's no like, Oh, your mom referred me, uh, blah, blah, blah. And they're thinking they're going to get a discount. It's like, Okay, well, no. So it's full price for my mom. It's full price for you. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's, 
yeah, that's, that's so true. Um, I, I can definitely say that uh, when applying discounts, the thing that we don't kind of factor in or don't um, recognize that we're going to do is we're going to bring our own emotions into it. And emotional pricing is the worst. It's kind of like emotional eating. You are just going to regret it later. Uh, although there yeah. is some and definite it's, ones. <laughs> it's back to the making assumptions thing too. Like you're assuming what kind of discount you should give or like that the person's even, as, uh, you know, um, the person's even like assuming they're going to get a discount. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, I do full price or free. I would say that's like my, my number one pricing tip. That's like such a game changer because there's no more awkwardness. There's no more wishy washiness. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that is if you're going to do free, um, still make the invoice and then just total it to zero so that your value is never questioned. Like the person who's getting that gift knows how much you would have charged yeah. for it full price. That is so true. That is actually something that I recommended a little while ago is like, if you're going that they, they don't know the value. And if you're going to do something that is, um, and this, this person had chosen to discount it, I'm like, well, tell them, tell them that's the reason why. Um, but also tell them like, this is what it actually would be worth because they don't know. It's not their job to know. It's our job mm -hmm. to tell them what it is actually worth. Oh, we're getting some questions. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Full price are free. I agree. Hard friends and true. Do you have any advice for someone who is struggling to get their business from casual and um, part-time to full-time with transitioning out of a full-time job? Ooh. Do you want to take that one? Uh, there's a lot there. There's a mm. lot there. <laughs> like, uh, transitioning what you're trying to do. Job. Yeah. I mean, are you asking about like what you can do to get yourself to a point where you can transition? Or are you asking about like the actual logistics of how to transition from being used to having a full-time job to now freelancing? Like I'm not mm. clear on, you know, what kind of advice are you looking for? Yeah. I, I feel like, um, what's it that can't asked um larissa jane if you want to jump in the um question boxes and you want to kind of go into a bit more detail oh both okay we've got both so i mean for me when i transitioned out of full-time work into full uh, full-time freelance i had a gap year kind of like what you would have at the end of your high schooling um of a year that I did a part-time job to do that transition between the two. So I had a three day a week design job. Um, and then those other days of the week, I would do like building my business, knowing that next year I will be full-time there. Um, and that was kind of what created that financial buffer because, you know, most businesses aren't profitable in the first couple of years at all. Like that's just the truth of it. Yeah. I love that. I think that there's so much value in making sure that your bills are covered before you ever start trying to do any of it full time, because when you turn your art into a business, it, uh, it changes things. And it also affects the quality of your work and the quality of clients that you're accepting. Because if you have to do something to get dinner paid for, you know, and feed your family, you're going to accept jobs that you probably wouldn't if you're if your bills were paid already, right? And so it's like a desperation thing. I think there's there's different levels of comfort in terms of like jumping out of a full-time job and trying to take this full-time. Personally, I would never have quit my job if I wasn't already replacing the income, like the salary that I was making there. But I, a lot yeah. of people, for a lot of people that could be unrealistic. Like it could mean that you have to have a buffer zone like like you did jazz where because like you know for me when i did that i didn't have kids i wasn't you know i wasn't responsible for anything but myself and so i was able to on the side of my full-time job work enough hours that i was essentially doing two full-time jobs at the same time for a lot of people that's not reasonable and it's hard to ever replace your salary when you have to do two two jobs like that but mm -hmm. i just i think yeah there's so much value in making sure that your bills are covered before you, before you jump. Uh, again, another Sean West thing, Sean McCabe, um, he wrote a book called Overlap 
Uh, and it's all about that. It's all about how you can overlap your your full-time job with your side hustle until you're able to replace the income. It's really, really good. It's on my bookshelf, like right back here. Uh, nice. I, I would read that. If you're in that place, I think it's really helpful. Um, and then in terms of like logistically, if she wanted the answer to both, like what it would actually look like transitioning from a full-time job to doing this freelance. I think one of the best things I did for myself was I started treating it like I was going to the office every day. Mm -hmm. There was no, like the day, the first day I worked for myself, I wasn't getting up any later. I didn't sleep in. I woke up and made my coffee. I got up, got dressed just like I would have if I was going to the office and started treating it like a real job. And it wasn't, it's, it was not a vacation. In fact, you're working harder. So I think mm -hmm. just starting to treat it that way right off the bat is helpful. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. And I was, I was the same as well. Um, I will admit that I do split my time between studio and home. Um, but it's still like a dedicated space. It's still, um, and you'll find also that if you treat it like the nine to five, uh, standard, I guess you'll find a lot of the time that, um, if you don't, you'll be working later and later and later into the night and you won't actually get that balance. And that's like a perfect recipe for burnout. Yeah. Uh, like not healthy whatsoever. And that's not to say that you're going to be working exactly nine to, I mean, that's the whole point of working for yourself is you can do it, whatever you want, but treating it like, like, like not treating it like you just quit your job and woo, it's like free for all, you know, because that sets you up for a bad situation. But like today yeah. I went shopping at 1 PM cause I just felt like it, you know, um, yeah. it, it just, yeah, you'll learn to balance. But when you start, I think it's smart to, to start it like it, like it's a full-time job. Yeah. And so there's a question that we've got here as well. Um, and how about when you put a product on sale, like they can put their course on sale for a specific time, explain the difference. Um, so I guess it's explaining the difference between uh, pricing for products and pricing yeah. for services. Um, yeah, I would, that would a say. huge difference. Yeah, huge, huge difference. Um, where, do, where do we even begin? I feel like that's a whole, you need to have a whole video about that. Um, <laughs> Pricing oh, that, that could actually be really cool to do a, uh, I know you've, you've uh, paused the YouTube uh, for the moment, but like future planning, I would love to do like a pricing for projects as opposed to pricing for products. I feel like that would be a really cool kind of discussion deep dive. Yeah. And, and I mean, even within products, you could separate it. Like I only yeah. put, I only put my digital stuff on sale. I, I don't have physical products that I put on sale apart from like last week black friday we did a tiny little one but like i wouldn't do what i do sometimes i'll put my digital products for 50 percent off <laughs> it's so different than if someone came to me asking for a 50 percent discount on a custom piece of artwork you know mm -hmm. uh it's not the same it's it's a totally different pricing psychology and when I'm talking yeah. about pricing, like in, in panic free pricing, it's all about pricing your services and your, your art and your lettering and your calligraphy versus pricing products because pricing products, the products go on sale. That's just how the world works. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's almost like the, the, the type of discounting is completely different. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, this is the thing is that, um, when you've created a product, you've understood that like there's an investment of time or creation, or you know exactly what your um, uh, input and your profit margin is. And then when you put that on sale, you're taking off the partial of the profit margin, like you're, you're, you're reducing that. Whereas if you're doing services, there isn't that like input output discount kind of structure so you can't actually justify discounting your time as opposed to discounting something that's like physical or digital. Yeah, that's that's what it is. You're if you're if you're discounting your services, you're discounting your time, which is means that you're going below your hourly rate, which means you're making less than your hourly rate, which you should never be doing. Versus when I put stuff <clears throat> when I put my products on sale, it's marketing. I have a, like I can calculate in my mind the payoff for the marketing versus mm -hmm. my you know my profits and my margins and stuff like that so 
It's a totally different it also, uh, ball game. I think it also depends on the audience for that piece. So like people who are an audience for a product have an expectation that a, a Black Friday or a Cyber Monday sale, like even way back in September, they're sitting there going, I know that this is going to be on sale. Like I've got a couple of things that I waited for to purchase specifically because I knew that they may or may not have a sale at that time. Whereas completely different for service-based industry. But hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie when I say that I shouldn't have ever discounted my courses to that degree when I started. Um, but I, I set it up that way when I started and now I have to keep doing it. It's like, if I were going to give, if I were, that's, that's something I would tell younger Becca. I would have said, Becca, don't discount your products 50% right off the bat. Okay. They're worth more than that. <laughs> yeah. I but I did it. It comes back to like, what are you training your ideal customer to do? Exactly. My customers are trained to have 50% discounts on my workbooks. And so now that's just the way my business model runs. But if I were advising somebody, I would advise them against doing that. So I mean, that's just the honest truth. I don't think that you need to discount your products that much. Um, mm -hmm. And even even at all, there are instances where I would tell people not to discount their products at all and instead do other things to incentivize people. You can have bonuses. You can have like, you know. Bundles. Exactly. Yeah. There's different ways to have extra value that isn't linked to discounting it or devaluing it. It's just I set myself up wrong when I started. Um there's some psychology that goes into pricing courses and online stuff. It's a whole other, it's a whole other video. I think there's a whole heap of psychology when it comes to pricing. And if, if that's something that you're wanting to deep dive into, like people like Blair Enns are incredible to, to watch and listen to what he does. He's fantastic at pricing creativity. Um, there's, you know, your Seth Godin's, uh, like there's, there's so many people out there that actually go more into the psychology of pricing. And if you can uh, upskill in that and actually understand that if you're avoiding sales and avoid talk talking about price, you're not going to get better at it. But if you start reading and questioning and asking the questions to be able to work out that pricing, I think that's really important. It's, it's self-development. For sure. Um, there's one question here. How long did it take you when you were starting your business to realize your worth and stand by your prices? I'm still learning every single day uh, new ways or, or new relearning how to stand by my own prices. It happens every single day. And I've been doing this for 14 years. Yep. I would say the same thing. There's never, there's never a job I'm quoting where I'm like, I'm fully confident in this price and I have n I don't give I don't give a damn if the person says yes or no. Like every time, of course, I'm 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 working on figuring out the right price and trying to feel like, yep, yeah, this feels good. Um, but I, I never am hitting send and feeling like, yep, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> never. Yeah. I actually have like a bit of a sliding scale. I have a couple of clients that are kind of sit in there, but that's because I've had them for five years and they know my prices and I know my prices and that they have an expectation, but then it comes to like a sliding scale. And I even got some in the middle where I, I'll be honest, I price them a little bit higher because I know that they'll try to pick apart my quote um, they'll try to change and alter the, the deliverables and the scope. Um, and they'll try to define my prices for me. And it's kind of freaking annoying. Um, and I've actually even said on the call to them, like, I've priced my prices for you because I know that in the past you've done this, this, and this. This is why I price the way that I do. And I stand mine by my prices. And I feel like that's a scary thing to do. Um, and it only comes with experience because I've known that client before. I think also it comes back to the like ditching desperation um, piece. Like if your bills are covered, then if a client says no, you'll be fine. Um, if they don't, if they don't agree to your price or if they don't value you, you'll be fine. Your bills are paid. Um, yeah. And so I think, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's ongoing. You always are growing your confidence in it, but I think that into a cycle of, 
value yourself, get a client who values you, feel good about the project. And then the next time it comes around, you're not going to drop your price again because you feel confident and you just get into this cycle where you just feel mm -hmm. confident over and over and over again. Um, and, and it, I mean, to answer the question, I'd say it probably took me a good, like two years of doing client work to really get into that cycle. Um, mm -hmm. and to not care what, whether or not a client said yes or no, like I'll, I'll be okay. It's not a me thing. It's a them thing. Yeah. And it's not a me thing is a them thing. It's a really, really good one as well. Like it's, um, I, I truly, truly believe that pricing isn't actually telling the client what it costs. It's giving them an opportunity to decide whether it's the value match for them. Like it's not actually mm -hmm. saying to them, this is what it costs in general. You're saying for me to be able to do this X, Y, and Z, it's up to you to decide whether you would like to work with me for these dollars. Um, for it's, sure. it's a question. It's not a statement. Mm -hmm. yeah it's a it's a it's a very interesting process but uh i love that there's actually people out there that yourself and others that nerd out a little bit about pricing because i get super nerdy about it <laughs> my favorite like my favorite live workshop my phone my phone my phone's dying sorry i keep cutting out um okay, you good. my favorite my favorite workshop i've ever run was uh and it's, it's um, still available as the five keys to confident pricing. Like Joanne and I get on there and just go like bananas, loving talking about it and giving people so much advice with it. Like I just, I get fired up yeah. about pricing because people constantly undervalue themselves and there's no more, like they just, they're stuck in the starving artist mindset and I'm done with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, let's turn some starving artists into hungry creatives and actually get fed. Like, that'd be nice. That'd be cool. I actually remember the day you, not the last one, but the one before maybe, um, the day you put it on, you had done this Instagram story. And don't ask me why it sticks in my head, but it does. And it was just you just being like, hey, guys, so I was just in the shower and thought of all of the different things that I want to add to this. So um, now there's like 172 slides. Thank you. Bye. I'm just like, it's supposed to be. That is passion. It was supposed to be five things and Joanne and I both woke up that morning and we're like, boy, what, like, we got to tell them about this and this and this and this. <laughs> uh, Look, anyway. we're passionate. We can't help it. Like, that's why we have, you know, pricing queen on the back. Yeah. You, you decorate cookies. I, I decorate rompers. I, uh... <laughs> well, we all have our weird thing. Although I like that you've inspired people to uh, do cookie decoration and a lot of puzzles as well. We've, we've very much deep dived into what puzzles you do and really don't like, you and I. Uh, <laughs> like the one that I told you that yes. is, it's not what it's on the box. What it was. Yeah, it? that would, no, I'm not in. Not in for that. <laughs> I was very impressed with the last couple. So that was, that was great. <laughs> I rotate between really hard, really easy, really hard, really easy. Yeah. Yeah, so like a, a 500, a okay. 500 piece is like. A quick one, yeah. Uh, Jazz, my phone is going to die, so I, I have okay, to Okay, well go. then let's wrap this or up. Or else I'm going to rudely. Okay. <laughs> Just like, Phew. that's happened on these. That's happened on these. So for those who, if you don't follow Happy Ever Crafter, I, I doubt you're actually probably watching because you're probably, uh, you know, She's amazing. But for those who want to find the Happy Ever Crafter and also Panic Free Pricing, let us know. Uh, I mean, at the Happy Ever Crafter here on Instagram, I think that's the easiest place. And then the link in my bio sends you all sorts of places. But if you want to go straight to the Panic Free Pricing course, it's panicfreepricing.com. Uh, awesome. And one of the things that we talked about a lot here was calculating what your hourly rate is. Um, we both deep dive into this one, but if you are wanting to work out what the billable time and value is of your time, um, head to easyaspiepricing.com slash calculate to use my free calculator. Thank you so much, Becca. I will see you at next week's party. Yay! Yes. See you next you Thursday on. for me and Friday for you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jazz, for having me. Bye. Bye.